Well, it's a number of years ago, to be exact, about the time of the dropping of an atomic bomb at Hiroshima, the age of materialism came to an end. Many persons have put all their faith in the advancements of science. And we're not intending to depreciate the good things science has done. But science as a way of life took a pretty bad beating at that time. And the condi conditions have continued till now. And we are all more or less living in the shadow of an unknown danger. A danger that might hit and may never hit. We hope it never will, but it has changed the entire psychology of mankind. <clears throat> we are no longer able to find in materialism a solution to our own personal existence. I know a number of materialists took one view on the subject, which gave them great con consolation. They said they were not going to survive but the contributions they made to human progress would survive. Those who came after them would give them a kind of vicarious immortality. They would live in their works, they would live in the contributions they had made, and they would find their own fulfillment in building this future they might never live to see. Well, it was a certain kind of solace and a great many thinkers accepted it. But now we have another difficulty. All these people working together for a future in which their labors will be recognized and useful are faced with the dilemma of what if there isn't any future? Supposing the individuals who have given their lives to learning have created a kind of learning which is going to die and take them with them. These learnings are not very optimistic, and the materialistic scientist is no longer very popular with himself, not too popular with his family, and has lost a lot of his station in world thinking. In other words, materialism as a solution to the purpose of human life has been undermined and has become something that is, is in unendurable to thoughtful and kindly persons. Now, during this period also, we have had the theological answer. The theological answer has done something to suggest a survival. But what kind of a survival? What does theology really offer? From a long time ago, religions used fear as a means of conversion. They warned human beings while they were alive that if they did not follow certain religious tenets, they will come into serious troubles after death. And out of all this came a concept of heaven and hell. Heaven for those who believed, hell for the unbeliever. A particularly good heaven for those who belong to certain groups. And a rather doubtful heaven for the rest. And uh, the general optimism of the ancient religions, which were more or less happy beliefs, was seriously damaged until very largely virtue was created or perpetuated mostly by fear, by anxiety, worry. And millions of persons went out of this life in a very unhappy state of morality. So gradually, the advancements of modern living have undermined the concept of heaven and hell as it was advanced in theological teachings. It did not seem to be particularly practical, especially if the results and rewards were to be based upon the present state of morality. There are very few good enough to go to heaven according to the old way of thinking. And we are creating more and more crime and dissipation and immorality 
we are suffering from more terrorism and religious conflict than we had known for a long time before. So this concept is also not entirely a happy one. Many, many young people today growing up do not want to be good because they fear hell. And they are perfectly aware of the fact they're not likely to be good enough to go to heaven. All this is very difficult for the death rate continues, the birth rate continues. They come and go as they always have. But their ultimate state or condition is still difficult to define. Yet without some concept of a future existence, the individual's present life becomes comparatively meaningless. In the old days when life was rather slower and people enjoyed themselves more, physical existence was accepted as a benefit. To modern man, m many human beings at least, Physical existence is a penalty. The individual must wander on through high taxes and unemployment and exorbitant prices and until at last he has to pay a reasonably exorbitant price for a funeral. <laughs> this all adds up to a great deal of strange disillusionment. And we have had in the last 10 or 15 years a large number of younger people who have broken away from practically every institution of the past. They are disillusioned because they do not see any straight pattern of, of life. The rich have very little advantage because they must leave their wealth behind in due time. All of the materialistic objectives of life are short-lived the individual building a political structure is building something that also will pass away. Almost everything we do in the material world is very uh, transitory and fragmentary. There is very little satisfaction of soul, very little depth of insight involved in our present way of life. We are not even allowed now to go home quietly and read a good book. There is a strange fascination about television, which not only does not give us much about death, but very little about life that's worth living. So we are really in a kind of a quandary. We're going somewhere. We're all going there. But where? How? And what? Are we going to go into oblivion? A question that Socrates asked. Are we going to some mysterious realm like the Elysian fields of the Greeks? Or are we going to the netherworld of Egypt and at the entrance of their afterlife was a money changer ready to change the currency of this world into the currency of the next? <laughs> it is a pretty thought because the currency of the other world had to be based upon virtue rather than upon real estate. So all these things have given us pause and are giving us more pause as time goes on. In the midst of all this also, there has been a tremendous upsurge of what might be termed mystical idealism. And a few years ago, mysticism and psychic phenomena and metaphysics were kind of unhappy words. People who used them too often were considered somewhat eccentric. Today, these are the popular words. And everywhere, individuals, groups are springing up to study the psychic life of the individual. The literature on the subject is becoming massive. Everywhere, everyone is beginning to think in terms of out-of-this-life uh, meaning meaning that goes into other spheres. And we are beginning to see much of the old thinking that uh, engrossed people like Paracelsus and even earlier, Plotinus, Pythagoras, and all these, they had certain thoughts. For a long time, material science said they were very foolish and put them into the background and their books and writings were available only in pulp editions. Now, all 
of these things are coming back. Every uh, folder we get from publishers today, it will include a number of ancient texts or early texts that had no market 20 years ago, but are now sought desperately by a new generation of truth seekers. And so the whole surface of our materialism has more or less broken down. It was inevitable, but there was nothing there in the first place. It was held up by sophistication and dissipation and extravagance. And these are not very helpful as we approach transition into another life. So the transition problem being inevitable and being universal, we have to begin to think more about it. And we do not like the idea of ending in nothing. And we're not too pleasantly uh, looking forward to the various decisions of the theological purgatories. So we begin to think of the only other alternative, and that is the doctrine of rebirth. Today, according to a publication, I see I saw somewhere, I can't quote it, but it's uh, in substance, nearly 10% of the people of this country now believe in reincarnation. That's probably more than that, because, of course, there is no way in which they're all going to stand up and be numbered. But the belief in rebirth is spreading very broadly through the world at the present time. It used to be but largely limited to the Eastern Hemisphere, where it had a considerable following. We may say, for instance, that even today, or maybe a hundred years ago, there were at least a billion reincarnationists in Asia. But this has more or less uh, been left vacant as far as the Western world is concerned. A few progressive thinkers and idealists played with the idea, and some mystical organizations stood firmly behind it and insisted that it was true. But at the same time, there was not very much popular interest. But now the popular interest is increasing. Not only the interest in reincarnation, but an interest in practically every mystical or metaphysical belief of the ages. We are digging back into the past to find something to live with now. We are not pleased with the prospects as they appear, and we are not producing out of any of our learned institutions the type of idealism which is satisfying to weary, world-worn human souls. The uh, intellectuals, the academics, still insist on clinging to their own way, but they are getting fewer followers every day. We just cannot live much longer with nothing to look forward to, or something to look forward to that looks more dangerous than being here. This is not uh, the type of situation that will bring any real comfort or consolation. Now, we have to face these problems with a, a certain amount of internal intelligence. Most of the matters that relate to invisible concerns, and most visible concerns emerge from the invisible, most of these invisibles are not to be handled within the scope of modern scientific progress. We cannot physically produce the evidence that might be required. We can't build a computer as yet that will do the job successfully. We cannot demonstrate scientifically a mystical universe. But we can internally experience the need for it. And we also have the consolation of realizing that while we cannot prove it physically, academically, the academic people can't prove their materialism any better. In both cases, it's an assumption. And the difference is that the materialist feels he has the advantage because certain material objects he can see and touch. But as these retire into his inner life, they become invisible, just as in every other case. So today, we are living in a world in which the belief in physical things is weakening. And the belief that there is something behind physical life, more important, is gaining strength. We also are falling into a whole group of social problems, 
that are becoming a, an unbearable nuisance. These problems are involved in home life, in the rearing of children, in employment, health, all the different phases of life. And it becomes increasingly obvious that without some kind of a moral structure, we are not going to be able to handle crime. We are not going to be able to bring up children as useful citizens or preserve the idealistic values of art and music and literature. We are not able to do any of these things unless there is some internal strength within ourselves. Not long ago, uh, several great paintings came up for auction. Uh, some of them were great classical works that have stood the test of ages. Some of them would be, I would regard, as rather poor. Uh, the rather poor ones brought the larger price at this particular auction. <laughs> And, and pieces of so-called art, alleged art, uh, with very, no significance of any kind, bring millions of dollars from people who have millions of dollars and very little taste. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> this situation goes on, and we see it coming back at us in every direction. In fact, it is becoming evidence that the world, evident that the world is passing into a cycle of bad taste. It is coming into a cycle of disillusionments, of debasements of value, and of the gradual determination to avoid all moral responsibility. The individual must now live in his own joy, and he's very unhappy over it. The joy isn't doing anything. We feel, or many people feel, that the individual has a right to live the way he thinks he should. Well, this would be better if he did little thinking, but that isn't part of it. The main answer to this pattern is that the individual wishes to remove all restraints upon personal conduct. He wants to do as he please, pleases, live as he pleases, think as he pleases, but he doesn't die as he pleases. He gets that as a bonus. And at the end, the uh, narcotic habit gets him, or one of the other things go bad. And we have this individual drifting out of existence with very little to, uh, to recommend either his conduct or his concepts of life. Now, all this is hitting people who are basically pretty fair thinkers, and they're not very happy about it. And in this interval, we find the solution that has been advanced by the ages as a, a, a true answer to a problem that has to be faced in some way, that reincarnation is probably the best answer that man has ever devised. Now we can say that man has devised it. <coughs> of course, it is not only sanctified by veneration, but it appears in the scriptural writings and teachings of most nations. It is a very definite part of human knowledge, human conviction, human belief, and human hope. Therefore, today, we are turning in this direction, <coughs> realizing that we actually are creatures in midstream. We are not good enough for a heaven worth being in. We are not bad enough to be re retailed into some mysterious inferno. We are here to grow. We are here to improve. We are here to build better lives for ourselves and each other. There is a purpose of some kind, although a large number of persons has never have never discovered that. They are not sure, but they are sure that they are here. And they are sure that they are living in a very wonderful world, in spite of the efforts of the human being to, to, to deteriorate it and, and destroy it. We are here in the presence of a great universal plan that extends beyond the horizons into the abstractions of space. We are here with all kinds of hopes and fears and ideals and convictions. And it is very necessary for us to make the most of these convictions. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to do something to grow the uh, world we want to live in. Now, we are testing out all kinds of solutions. We are hoping, some are hoping, 
that by superior armament we're going to make it. The trouble is this is competitive, and nearly any form of armament that we can conceive can be also used against us. So the solution of war to any human problem is merely a negative evasion of responsibility. There is no hope of solution in such an attitude. Therefore, we begin to space out the economic system. We're going to have to take greater care of the underprivileged. We're going to have to do more things to distribute and diversify the assets of the world. We look a little careful at this particular point of view, and we discover a world of, a world of shrinking resources. We are cutting down the timber, draining off the earth, and uh, destroying most of the inhabitants of the world in which we live, both human and otherwise. We are struggling against uh, resources which we have wasted and are continuing to waste because of lack of any moral or ethical conviction. And even many religions make no point of this. They make no point of wasting natural resources. Some realize it, but all private citizens experience it. There we experience the need for economy. We, need, we experience the need for getting together, living together, and having a purpose, exist, purposeful existence. And we come to another final conclusion, namely, that that type of an existence might be the key to our after-death state. Reincarnation is based upon the fact that we are growing creatures in an evolving structure. We are living out day by day uh, the plan of nature. And we are also facing, as Socrates also pointed out, we are facing the payment of sin every day. Now, sin does not mean evil. The word itself means shortcoming. And therefore, a sin of, of omission is the type which we mostly suffer from. We do not do that which is best or necessary, and by second best and third best selections, we fall into trouble and error and, dis and discomfort. Actually, according to the Oriental philosophers, who seem to be pretty good on this thought, we are here to grow, to fulfill, to perfect not only ourselves but our world, and produce a safe environment for, for each other that can endure as long as the mysteries of growth remain incomplete. We should be able to look forward to thousands of years of peace, thousands of years of growing integrities, in which we daily outgrow some small part of our smallness and emerge into some small part of our largeness that lies beyond. We are here for a purpose. We are here to get over our own mistakes. We are here to find that sin does not pay, also that crime is expensive. We are here to do things right. And it is obvious that we're not quite ready to make this jump into security which the world needs. But it's coming. And even today we notice in society a marked determination to put values into better relationships. We are beginning to recognize the importance of building friendship, comradeship, cooperation, and uh, common affection for each other. We are moving gradually from a very competitive way of life, which is gradually destroying not only ourselves but the planet on which we live, and a cooperative way of life in which man and nature, in cooperation, can conserve resources, fulfill the needs of, its, of existence, and build a credit system for good deeds well done. This is all part of the problem that we face. And in order to have time enough to do some of these things, we have to struggle with the one life concept of existence. One life is a very short time in the great cycle of things. One life in each individual case is variously conditioned. The average person is not born into a completely fortunate environment. He may be rather well situated, but he may also be physically infirm, 
we may be in an environment in which there is little opportunity for growth, we cannot say for certain that each individual can be legislated into a, t a, t a state of grace. It's just not possible. But we are all here to grow. And in order to grow, each individual must gradually become a little better than his own past. He must gradually develop in himself those, uh, those values which in the end will protect his place in, the, in space just as much as his present local environment. So re we begin to think in terms of reincarnation as a simple way of preserving natural honesty. In other words, if we live in an honest universe, and practically every philosophy and religion of importance in the world believes this, then we have to be honest ourselves. And we have to face the consequences of action. In the smaller way of life that we call a personal embodiment, from the cradle to the grave, we are constantly in the face of debt. We are constantly doing things for which there must be some type of a penalty. We are thoughtless, we are unkind, we are cruel, we are dishonorable, and the result is that there is a reaction that is not pleasant. Now, we always seem to blame this reaction upon someone else. We don't like to assume the fact that we have a system built into our own natures by which compensation is appropriate to the needs of occasion. We do not realize that we cannot be destroyed by someone else. We cannot be saved by someone else. The whole process of growth rests upon the development of the integrities by means of which we protect our own individual existence. This, this way of growth is not a difficult thing. It is a, apparently difficult when the individuals involved are isolated in the midst of a highly competitive system. But in fact and truth, cooperation is a comparatively simple thing. It is simply the individual doing what he probably instinctively would do if penalties did not prevent. We do not want war. We do not want crime or poverty. But we do not individually know how to control the processes by which these things are created or caused. They all start in ourselves somewhere. The entire system of human regeneration is locked within each individual himself. He is the cause of his own evil and the cause of his own good. He is the cause of his own difficulties, and he must be the cause of their solution. And he can be, because within himself is an equipment capable of meeting every emergency of human life. But this equipment has to be used properly. It has to be dedicated to some cause that is important enough to require a great deal of personal attention. Now, all physical causes... And all physical consequences are very ethereal and ephemeral. The individual trying to solve all things in terms of his own physical existence is, is wrong to start with. There is no way in which the individual can cure his internal ills by merely changing his environment. Lots of people would like to wish it. But if a person with a poor nature enters a good environment, he will not improve, but the environment will be damaged. Each person must solve his own problem. And in solving his own problem, pay his own bills, take care of his own future, plan an intelligent way of existence for himself and those dependent upon him, and do all that he possibly can to increase the inter internal stability of the society to which he belongs. Therefore, reincarnation becomes a means of facing into yourself. It is the beginning of spiritual, moral, and ethical honesty. It is a final proof that you cannot be saved by somebody else, that you cannot be perfected without growing yourself, and you cannot be better than you are unless you make yourself better than you are. Now, the little difficulty that seems to be showing up at the moment is that while most people are becoming interested in this, there is a kind of weakness involved in the present program. The individual wants to grow, 
and he devotes certain time, effort, and even resources to, the, to growth, but he does not particularly seem to want to change or correct his own mistakes. He is trying to grow on a religious, philosophical, or intellectual level without involving ethical reform. He wants to be selfish and saved. He wants to keep everything he has and, have the, and be virtuous as a philanthropist. He wishes to have a perfectly happy home in which other people are all right because they agree with him. He wants to be in the church that is successful and has a nice large congregation, but he does not expect to get over selfishness. He does not forget, expect to change in his business life policies which are corrupt or dangerous to integrity. The individual wants to get better without losing any of the advantages of a bad life. He wants to keep on disliking the people he dislikes and uh, t uh, voting in the politicians who do the most for him and all these kind of things. He also is also watching con constantly for a bargain regardless of who is damaged. So these problems do not seem to change in spite of the fact that there is a strong idealism coming out of the problems of the day. These people are trying to do all kinds of things that are better. But against the things that are the better are the constant overwhelming presence of vanity, selfishness, and ambition. The individual is not really making the basic changes in his own life. And as a result of that, the legislations we hope for are not successful. The reforms we try to vote in, even if they are voted in, do not make much of an impression upon the vices for which they were intended to be the corrections. Now, the, uh, this brings us right back now to the ethical system of reincarnation. It is one of the greatest legalistic solutions the world has ever had to its problems. It simply states very clearly that what you sow, so shall ye reap. Or as Buddha put it, the ox and the cart. The ox leads and the cart follows. And wherever the ox leads as a cause, the wagon is behind as an effect that must be faced. Therefore, our whole problem of a new morality, a new ethics, a new integrity is important to our personal happiness and security. The individual who does it right will have the security in this world and will look to the future with a good hope. The uh, laws of cause and effect tell us that every cause has to have an effect. If we set the cause in motion, we have to endure the effect. Now, there are lots of causes we can set in motion which we will not live to cure. We will make decisions on our deathbed which will require almost immediate revision. We can do all kinds of things to get ourselves in as fortunate position as possible, but the individual has to realize that we have a, an account in the bank of the infinite and most people are a bit overdrawn on this account. <laughs> to meet this difficulty, the individual has to assume responsibility. If we are selfish, there isn't a religion and the philosophy or an ethics or a science in the world that can cure selfishness. We can only cure it ourselves. We may be forced to be unselfish by circumstances, but if so, the moment the circumstances change, the selfishness comes back. We have to correct these things, not because of laws, litigations, or mass movements of society, but in ourselves, if we expect to grow. Now, there are groups, many groups of mystically minded people coming into popularize this particular time in our history. And most of these people want to be helpful, useful, and constructive. And also, they wish uh, to be part of a new way of life for us all, a way of life that must come, a new age that is on 
the way, the threshold at the moment, because of the fact that the, that which has gone before will not endure and we know it. But the question is, on most cases, to stay as we are until we are on the very brink. And when the, we are tottering half over the edge, then we will begin to think in terms of repentance. But it won't work that way. The time we have to start to grow is the moment we realize we need to. And we need to grow the moment we realize the troubles we're in. That wherever there are broken homes and all kinds of neglected children, overdrawn expense accounts, all kinds of secret processes going on that are not right, all these things are deadly enemies of the security we seek. And we have to start by realizing that all the changes must begin with ourselves. Now, when we start working with ourselves, we need a good motive. That's been one of the great problems, because it's going to be a long time before complete selflessness can be expected. Up to then, we're going to have to have a sort of divided allegiance, a little in favor of ourselves, but also something in favor of the larger and more important cause. So we have to begin the moment we believe in idealism, the moment we believe in honesty, the moment we want to see a better world, we immediately become responsible for participating in this progress. We must do it ourselves. We do not do it by simply physically supporting organizations, but, and then the organization cannot serve us if it is only supported and not actually emulated in its principles. So here we are, various stages of uh, age in this world, with a great sense of, real, of responsibility. The human being inside himself, if you go far enough into him, we find great truths lurking there. The individual, regardless of his affirmations of materialism or idealism or anything else, the average individual does not believe in death. He does not believe in dissolution. He does not believe in eternal damnation. He does not believe that he can evade all the responsibilities of his own conduct. The truths of the matter are inside of us and we know it. But these truths interfere with certain selfish projects of the moment and these gain acceptance and the truths remain quiet or quiescent. We don't do much about them. But we're coming now to the point where everyone is asking, how are we going to handle this situation? Nature and the universe has given us the way to handle it. And it, it is handling it for us, whether we like it or not. The universe is determined we're going to make the grade. We are going to succeed, even though we object to the bitter end. We're going to be happy sometime if we have to feel to be miserable to do it. Actually, the laws of nature are long-range, and the law of cause and effect is an infinite law. It is everywhere, in space and in the human heart. The law of cause and effect is inevitable. The law of uh, karma, consequence, is the law of cause and effect applied to the life of individuals. Karma means, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And that which we do shall come back to us. And there is no possible way of avoiding the results of our own actions. We can escape them for a moment. But those things which have been done in secret are known to the one person that is important, our own inner self. There is no escaping it. Karma must operate. There must be retribution and reward. Now, we think usually of karma as a very painful procedure, but this is not true. The law of cause and effect does not mean that we were just simply born to suffer. The law of cause and effect tells us that if we sow the seeds of happiness, we will be happy. As it was in the Arabian fable, happiness must be earned. That which deserves happiness will be happy. And the individual who develops the integrities with himself will benefit by his own integrities. 
he will also become a better citizen of the community. And if enough people agree on the level of the integrity of conduct, social problems will also fade away because they're all based upon compromises and indifferences and a kind of spiritual ignorance which does not recognize the truth of human purpose. So we have the law of cause and effect, we have the law of karma which op operates that way, and we have the law of rebirth. We call it a law because to most people it is a law. It was so known to the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Persians and the Hindus and the Chinese. It is a part of existence that the thing which exists does not cease to exist. There may be change and there will be change, but every creature that exists, every form of life, has somewhere within itself a seed of immortality. It will pass through infinite changes, appear and disappear, come forth and fade, but it will never die. Therefore, all living things are part of a living universe, and the living universe cannot tolerate death in any part of itself any more than the human being, the body of man, can endure a local death without the whole body becoming involved. So the law of rebirth is something that tells us that we are constantly changing but always growing. Now, some people are a feeling of, of abuse. They feel that they are being shortchanged all the way along. Some people realize that they come into this life much better privileged than others. And in all things, we wonder why the inequalities of life. If we want to see the inequalities of our environment, look into ourselves, the inequalities of a family. A family is made up of individuals, each of whom has a temperament or disposition of its own. Some members of the family will work beautifully together to protect the family. Others will walk away and leave the responsibility and go off in an isolated way of their own. And if the family breaks up, the sorrow is distributed through all. Now, in reincarnation, we have the same kind of a situation. We have a level of concept of conduct which, if we can live it, will prevent the development of further karmic responsibilities. If we sow good seed, we will give a good harvest. If we keep on sowing selfishness, we will be selfish and the victims of selfishness. It all it consists of putting our own lives into a straight constructive pattern. We, we like to avoid paying bills if there's any possible way of doing it. And people are known to move away from a place, take a new name, and start a new business just to get away from a bill. In nature, there's no getting away. That is uh, one of the peculiar factors of this subject. There is no way of escaping the consequences of conduct. Consequently, we must expect as we start out in life to start with the realization that we are bringing some debts with us. We are bringing with us unfinished business. We are, we are bringing with us the consequences of wrong action, wrong thought, wrong emotion. We are bringing in the imperfect parts of our nature with the hope that this focusing upon them will cause us to improve our ways. Every problem that is unsolved means that we have yet to learn something. If we have an unfortunate family situation, we have to learn something from it. We have to look inside of ourselves and find out what we must know from that particular experience. We also have the further advantage of being able to see it at the present time, working out while we're in this world. This is a kind of laboratory experiment in which we can see almost immediately when we've made a mistake. But even after we've made a mistake, we may not want to correct it. We may want to say, well, we'll brush it, on, we'll brush it under the corner of the rug. We don't want to take any responsibility for it. We're going to walk out on it. Or we can walk out on the mistake, but it's in karma, and we'll never walk out of that. The mistake that we don't solve becomes part of unfinished business that we carry into the future. 
No, there is nothing that we carry into the future that is fatal. There is nothing that can't be solved. And most persons, average individuals, who make mistakes do not make very big mistakes because they do not have opportunities or the probabilities of impulses that are very big. Most of the mistakes are commonplace, more or less within the range of our present understanding. But we have to face them. If we have a broken home, we have to learn somewhere, sometime, what broke it. We have to get over our own responsibility in the matter. Now, if it so well happen that it isn't our person problem, perhaps we are not the one to blame. But if we are truly not the one to blame, then we don't carry the karma forward. The incident becomes the basis of a new strength immediately, an individual bigger than his problem, more gracious and forgiving than his adversary, has already built a good karmic solution to a difficult problem. But reincarnation is the problem of adjustment, solution, taking care of previous mistakes, and establishing the foundations of future happiness. The good we do also lives after us. The good we do also lives after the inner life of ourselves. If we have made a contribution to human society and we are lovingly remembered by the world, it is very likely that when we face this problem comically, we will discover that we have earned a very good uh, asset in our re-embodiment cycle. When we, something awfully nice happens to us, or we are very successful in the presence of a great emergency, it is because we have earned it. It is because it is our proper and just due. But unfortunately, the average person who has such a fortunate happening doesn't recognize his own earning of it. He probably accepts the fact that he is entitled to it. We all do that. No one was ever able to completely alienate the thought that we get what we deserve. But when we get what we deserve and it is good, it is our benefit. If we get what we deserve and it's bad, it's somebody else's fault. We just have this way of looking at things. But if we look around, we'll see that in our daily lives, there are good things and things that we haven't handled too well. In our karma, looking at it from a cycle of rebirth, there are all kinds of incidents, principles involved. The incidents, the incident themselves itself is not the main thing. It is the motive behind it. It is the thing that inspired or impelled it and the way it was accomplished. If these were right, then we don't have any bad karma from it. Without the right integration ourselves, however, we continue to suffer from the mistakes that we have made. Now, fortunately for a great many people, in the production of reincarnation, uh, this law operating, we have been given a certain protection against the flooding in of karma. We are protected against being faced by more than we can bear or carry at any one time. We are only expected to meet those problems which we can handle at that time. Problems being t entirely beyond our handling are also beyond our comprehension at that time. They will come in due course, but they're not a problem of the moment. But because we have the prior to power to handle these things and to do what we want to with them, we find a certain interesting circumstance arise in connection with religion. We, uh, today, there are a great many individuals who are involved in various forms of psychic experimentation. Uh, they are using whatever means they have or can to try to uh, sound the depths of their own subconscious, unconscious, or mystical parts of their natures. They are seeking to find some kind of a superpower, some kind of a super realization that will lift, the, lift them out of the present doldrums in which they find themselves. They are looking for a solution on a religious level. And to do this, they begin experimenting with psychic disciplines, yoga, Vedanta, or this type of thing, or mediumistic procedures, or other types of psychic experience. And uh, 
these problems can be difficult. Now, there's no question in the world that there is a wide band of genuine psychic phenomena. But there is also another type, which is something we all have to watch for and be very careful of. The development of a super faculty, something that we have never had before, the legitimate growth of it, is a problem in karma. The individual who deserves an extension of consciousness will have it. An individual who tries to get it without deserving it has a problem on their hands. And this problem is showing up all through society at the present moment. The individuals staying as they are in all else are now, the individual is now trying to develop extrasensory perceptions in a compound personality in which the merits are not sufficient. There is, therefore, always the danger of delusion. An individual who believes that he can have something he hasn't earned is subject to this problem, and the individual who believes that he already has something that he hasn't earned is, must be very careful or he can get into serious trouble. The, uh, the point of psychic phenomena is that it must come through a proper channel. It must come through the only channel that is truly correct, and that's our own. It must come through because of the, the walls or barriers between the material and the ideal have been slowly removed. The, the, the release from the internal of the individual can be and is probably the greatest of all mystical experiences. It is something that is not created by any outside factor whatsoever, but is created by the merit of the person, the dedication of the individual, and by a certain sacrifice of superficials to the protection of that which is real. One, therefore, everyone looking for psychical development or mystical development or things of that nature should also be ever watchful to correct them any weaknesses or failings within themselves which would detract from their rightness that, that would give them the privilege of being better people. Therefore, always, if you develop some form of mystical uh, contact or have come to some serious or deep belief in such mystical beings or things, also take a very careful look to make sure that you are really entitled to it, that you have earned a greater degree of consciousness than you have at the moment if you can honestly know that you deserved it. Because at the moment you are better in every part of, every part of your nature than you were years ago. That you understand more, that you're more tolerant, more understanding, more sympathetic, with more love and charity in your nature. Then these changes in psychic balance can be understood. But if the person just simply decides that they're going to become a psychic, and then those goes through various exercises which can produce psychic phenomena. Then there is a danger of self-deceit. There is a danger that what is coming through is not what they're seeking, but what they deserve. And this can be a very disillusioning experience. We've had many down through the years who've gone through some of these experiences. And one of the most common ones is a kind of psychism in which something very beautiful, something very wonderful, some wonderful message, uh, some supernatural situation arises, and the person who has it is completely entranced by it, feels that they have achieved everything, and are just full of this wonderful experience. If this uh, is not, however, properly earned, the individual will gradually notice something. He will notice that the beautiful experience is turning against him. He will learn that where he had great hopes, fears creep in. Where he was so certain, uncertainty is taking over. And where he has seen only the beautiful, that which is not beautiful becomes not acknowledged and recognized. The experience has failed because the individual's personal life did not deserve it, was not able to maintain it, and therefore was in trouble afterwards. So always, when you want to know more, earn it. <laughs> now, it may happen that due to karma, 
you are not going to find that all the doors open easily. Some of this problem must go on into other embodiments. The bringing forward of karma uh, must be properly met and may often result in a, a, an unfortunate or unpleasant uh, series of conditions. The individual can look back on a life which has been unusually severe in unfortunate occurrences. And uh, when looking back in this way, he's very apt to pity himself. He is very apt to be sorry that his own life has been damaged in this way. But the moment a person can look back over the doings of a lifetime, or most, most of the lifetime, and find that things have been always a little difficult, or always a little unrewarding, then the question should arise in the mind immediately, why? And if we ask that question honestly, it is not just answered uh, by the fact that other people have been unfair. It is actually answered by the fact that we have been unable to face circumstances correctly. And our great difficulties have been that we are suffering from our lack of ability to handle a comparatively normal situation, if we knew how to handle it. We also know that there are situations that are natural and inevitable that are not pleasant. We have to face them. But we also have to face them with a strength within ourselves which is great enough to lift us above the problem and help to find a solution. In the law of karma, no individual has to pay the same bill twice. If he pays it in the first place, he's through. If he doesn't pay it in the first place and pushes it off, it comes back even unto the sixth or seventh life into the future. We never get over it till we solve it. Now this is nature's way for a kindly, loving, divine principle to make sure all the children receive the proper discipline. A family without discipline is in trouble. A world without discipline is in danger. And the undisciplined condition of our present society is a very strong warning that something must be done. More and more people are accepting this warning. They realize that the time has come to correct a whole series of faults and build a new way of life. That we have to build on this planet a way of life that is acceptable to natural law, that is considered proper for us. We are an ambitious creation frustrated by living on a molehill. Instead of having the largest star in, the sp in space as our home, so our ambitions could grow. We have a lot of ambition and a very limited atmosphere. The earth is not very big. The population is increasing all the time. And uh, some have said that the population increase is being somewhat hastened by the fact that many people are going out with more karma and have to come back sooner. This is a, a matter of... Uh, uh, interpretation, but guilty spirits have those kind of ideas as they go along. Actually, the uh, whole situation is one in which moderation and sort of kindliness is to shift the way of life. We, what are the objectives so a person can be happy? Uh, how, do, how can we live in a world in which it is so congested or so overwhelmed with problems or responsibilities, that there seems to be no answer and no cure. Actually, this world has many untouched joys that wait for us to be able to understand them. This world is a very beautiful place. It has almost everything imaginable, so many wonders beyond science that science can't even analyze them. We have everything necessary except that we have to get over the willfulness of the fallen angel. We have to get over the determination to excel someone, to compete, to create our own private molehill somewhere on the larger molehill. We have to assume that there is some kind of a great joy in defeating someone else, that there is a tremendous vitality in the thought of revenge, that all kinds of things that we don't like have to be taken away or we will go and fight about them. Nations are fighting. And after all the thousands of years of war, it wouldn't seem that nations could continue 
to follow the same old error. We thought we were through, with largely through, with religious persecution. Now we have it right on our doorstep again. We thought we were a little bit too wise anymore to go out and fight with the Medes and the Persians, but they're here. And we have not solved the basic problems of human relationship. And yet we are li living in a world where there is no cause for these problems except ourselves. These problems do not descend from the sky. They are here because we are a peculiar kind of people who seem to be trouble prone. We try to do everything the wrong way. <coughs> this problem is always a difficult one. But the problem is also that this world would be something we could pass on to our children and their children as a glorious gift, something in which all dreams and hopes and aspirations within reason could be fulfilled, and where those that are too high to be fulfilled here can be reached by the stars and the ladders that lead to the sky. We are here we are capable of all good. Why are we not all happy then? Because each individual has de depended like a family on the spoilage of parents. They think the parent is too kindly to do anything to punish them, or they are wayward enough to tell the parent to do what it pleases. And a lot of people have told God to do what he pleases, and that's just the problem. He does. <laughs> and he does what is necessary, not what we want. So all in this problem is that karma can build a beautiful life, and reincarnation can put us here to enjoy it. We can do all kinds of very grand and gorgeous things with life. We can develop all kinds of releases of inward potentials. We can become more and more complete persons, and in that matter, gradually deify our own lives. Somewhere in the end of things, the human being will be as a god, knowing good and evil. Somewhere along the way, we are going to outgrow our humanity and come closer and closer to that divinity which now shapes our ends. We can do almost anything we want to do if we want to do it badly enough to overcome the impulse not to do it. We can do these things very easily and win all these great uh, labors that we have uh, to face, but we can't continue to be selfish. We cannot build a world based entirely on the dollar mark and then go victoriously into a universe in which the dollar is absolutely worthless. It's everything that we are working with and emphasizing is here, when in reality we are merely on a grand tour. In the old days, the, after an education, young people of affluence were given the grand tour, a year in Europe or something, as a finishing school or something to give them culture. Well, we are here on the grand tour of the planet Earth. We're here to learn something, to understand. We learn to see the divine plan in things. We understand the wonders of nature, the wonders of beauty. We learn to appreciate music. All these kind of things are available to us. And we just settle back and remain miserable. Because we don't really try. Religion has tried to do it. But religion wasn't as strong as human selfishness. Science has tried to do it and hasn't been able to get beyond its own selfishness. Modern philosophy is, for the most part, a dead loss. It has done very, <coughs> very little to solve any of the problems of the day. Therefore, the person comes back to himself. Beginning at any given moment, the individual can start the disciplines which were concealed and covered in the ancient legendary by the rites of initiation and rituals of entry into the various secret orders. All of the schools, for example, that were important in Athens were, ra were ruled over by scholars. A single scholar usually had a dozen or twenty disciples, and that constituted a school. The same was true in India, where the old Arhats had their disciples and they sat on the side of a hill and studied the problems of the universe. But in Greece, these schools were run, ruled over uh, by uh, uh, pedants or, or sages or 
Some even believed that they were ruled over by sophists or professional educators. But in any event, they were ruled, and they taught, and they had considerable knowledge on things worthwhile. But every one of these schools demanded something. And when you went to school in Athens, you had to prove that you were entitled to go to school. You had to make certain dedications. The teacher would say to you, you want education. All right? Education is a, has a price. Education is not free, even though I don't charge you anything for it. Because education makes you responsible for your contribution to the common good. If you are learned, you are responsible to the degree of your learning. If you go to the first step, you are responsible there. If you go through to the highest form of postgraduate course, then you are responsible for a large part of society. And wherever you learn, you become harmless. Where you do not learn, you become harmful. Whenever you do the thing that it has to be done, you grow. Where you use knowledge to exploit someone else, you start that bad karma that's going to bring you back to suffering in next incarnation. Now this was told these young people. There is no free learning. Because the more we know, the more our duties are. For it is the duty of every living thing to do that which it knows to be right. Even animals have certain traces of these problems. But in any event, now in our modern education, do we begin by teaching young people their moral duty to the world in which they live? Probably not too seriously, because if the teacher really did it, they'd probably lose the job. But we are now taught how to get well, as rich as possible with no social responsibility, no demand upon us to be better people, just to, uh, to graduate cum laude is all that is necessary. That is not the way of wisdom. The way of wisdom is that everything we do that is improving us is part of a privilege that we have. And this privilege depends for its continuance upon our adding our gifts and our strength to the common good. And so as more we do it that way, the better we come back in the next embodiment. The more we have earned, the more we will be able to do that is right. If, however, we do not do any of these things, and we just simply take life for what it's worth, get a job, retire finally on Social Security, and pass on, we have not done much with the potential that nature has given us. We have limited our life to this world. And, of course, that means we're going to come back because we have never, oh, we've never outgrown our own mortality. We have never outgrown the weaknesses by which we are forced to face the future. Reincarnation is a blessed thing, therefore, really a wonderful thing, because it assures our ultimate victory. It assures the fact that we are going to come on back until we learn to do it right. And when we do it right and come back, we will have achieved the highest good of which a human being is capable. And that highest good means the greatest usefulness to others. The, the height of all growth and usefulness, finally, is that the individual can consciously cooperate with the divine plan to which we belong. This is the way it should be and the way it has to be in order to be successful. Therefore, let's not think of uh, growth merely as a kind <coughs> of competition in which we try to be a little wiser, a little better, a little better informed than someone else. Growth is not this at all. Growth is a very simple process in which the individual learns more and more about right, about doing it as it should be done. And the individual with, if with poverty learns to improve his state. The person of wealth learns to share that which is necessary to the common good. The, uh, the enlightened person who doesn't share is taking bad karma and he will have to come back maybe in poverty because he hasn't used his wealth to any constructive purpose. 
the individual who takes his wealth and goes to some place and wastes it on a gaming table is has lost and wasted something that could have become a great asset. It could have become the basis of nobility. It could have been the basis of a great desire to serve. It could have been used to help the world. But being used only to waste as wasteful, back the individual comes and must learn what it means not to have that kind of resource. Nothing that is wasted escapes karma. And not, no one who is a wastrel escapes reincarnation. So we have to all watch these things. And it shouldn't be a great pain for the individual not to waste what he has or to dissipate himself into an early grave. Why should these things seem to be so important that we live badly in order just to die badly? There's no need for this at all. But there's gradually coming into realization that beyond the kingdoms of the earth, there is the kingdom of heaven. And heaven is not just a place where there are angels and stars and so forth. The word heaven means really higher, above, more. It means rather that there is a region available to all of us in which good is supreme. In the old days in China, they had a belief that somewhere in the midst of the desert of Gobi, there was a great and wonderful sanctuary and that all those who loved God and served their fellow men finally gathered into this great sanctuary of the enlightened and there formed a kind of over-government of the world. This over-government, however, was under law. This over-government did not mean that these people could change law. No matter how many sages all gathered and willed together not one truth could be destroyed or one uh, error be supported. They only, these wise ones only, became stewards trying to help everyone to use their powers and, and potentials for the common good. We have to be finally a socialized world, a world of cooperation, a world in which the incentives for life are no longer cheap incentives. Now we are no longer satisfied to be the richest body in the graveyard. Where we are no longer inclined to look with great exaltation on the first billion or something of this nature. These things constitute a kind of illusion. If there is a world of fantasy without fact and substance, it's the one we're in now. The real world is a world of value, the world of integrity. And by degrees, each of us is graduating from this particular environment into something better. But on some occasions, as was in the old days of the old red schoolhouse, the only way some people got out of school was to burn the building down. There was no other way. They never could graduate. Well, if we don't any of us graduate, we might burn another building down, a big one. So we have to think very much of cooperating with a divine plan and that the machinery of this cooperation operates can no longer be denied. That there is no possible way of evading the realities. That the divine plan in itself is so complete, so perfect, and so inevitable that there is no human being that can break it. There is no real human being who wants to break it because this plan ends in the common good of all that lives. And this is the most important thing. What we want now, we won't want tomorrow. The pleasures of today will, we will be outgrowing, just as it, we outgrow the pleasures of childhood. But the growth program goes on and on and on. It becomes part of an inevitable part, pattern devised for our good and to our inevitable victory. In this way, therefore, reincarnation just makes sure that we don't fail. It, was, it might look as though we failed if in one life we went out in the delirium tremens or something of that nature. It would look like a failure. But in the law of reincarnation, it is an incident. It is a mistake that must be paid for. But it does not mean that the individual has failed or that he goes down to the earth to become nothing or that he goes somewhere to rot in some purgatory. It is all part of growth 
and no matter how we, much punishment we deserve, we will meet it, go on, and grow. And in course of time, we will become wise enough to earn more beautiful things and stop earning things that are not so beautiful. We will begin to store up our treasures where the mold and uh, evil will not take them. We will learn to be, create values and joys that do not mean the exploitation of our neighbor. We will find wonderful opportunities to grow and joy. We will find the universe is not just a heavy school. The universe is full of fun. It is full of wonderful and happy and pleasant things to do together. But in order to do that, each individual must become a more or less enlightened person. And this is what is going on year by year, age by age, life by life. We are all learning to become one beautiful family of all good relatives, good friends, cousins, uncles, and nephews, all dwelling together in a happy relationship and more and more aware of the magnificent universe till to be explored and that there is a world around us, within us, and beyond us that is so fascinating that we will never outgrow the joy of exploring it. We do not have to do, have to do a lot of kind of silly little unpleasant things to find something to do. The universe is full of things to do. And among the things to do will be to keep this plan which goes on forever and which brings ages after ages into focus and is forever graduating life into nobler spheres and vistas. It's all a very beautiful thing. And when that happens, we will, be, we will come back rather pleasant and happy into a world that is happy and pleasant. The pains of birth and the pains of death will be no more. We will live in a life of adjustment which improves in health, which takes care of our problems, which assures our fact that we can all earn an honest living and in earning it rejoice with all others who do the same. We can, could be a beautiful, happy, united world. And we will be if it takes 500 more incarnations to get there. <laughs> We're going to get there. And it's going to be more and more easy. Because with each little step of increased insight or understanding, they, the final good is closer. The mere fact that in this present generation, more people are beginning to realize this is a sign that the old reincarnation law is bearing fruit. People suffer long enough, decide to get over it. This is the way it was intended to be. And after a while, we find out why we suffer, and we stop doing that. Then from there on, our incarnations will be much more favorable, and we'll have a much better world for ourselves, and something to pass on to those who come back into embodiment when we go out. We are preparing a world for others not born here yet in this particular environment. Let's make it as good as we can for the entities that are coming in. And I hope that by that fact alone, we will make it easier for us to leave and in due course come back again. It's one great happy family if we could just get around to understanding it. But we are as bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, we are slow of learning. And out of the slowness, we've had 500 wars in the last 2,000 years. So we need more understanding, and it begins with us. It begins with the individual. Each person has to be an, an essential element in the regeneration of human society.